I'm Clark Whiting. I'm here with my colleague Chris Hawes. Uh, we're with Cementation. And uh, we were invited to share uh, a tool that uh, we've just, uh, in, in really in the past year, uh, been trying to implement into our uh, normal practice. Now, you know, what I want to make sure is that, uh, but before I say that, how many here have had a chance to, before we, we ate or came in here, had a chance to actually see the VR, the virtual reality system? A few of you. Um, what's difficult about this presentation is uh, it, it would be like me trying to describe what it's like to ride on a roller coaster if you've never actually ridden on one. Uh, you, 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 I won't do it justice, but the second you get on that roller coaster and you go over that first edge, you'll, you'll get it, you'll understand, right? So that's a little bit about what this is. So I encourage you, uh, if you get the chance, to put the headset on and experience it because then it will become real to you. Um, but what I'm gonna describe to you here is not VR as, as a new technology. Yes, it's exciting. Uh, yes, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with it from maybe your kids and the gaming world. They, they have all these fantastic games out there now that just immerse the kids in this real situation and they, they're just intoxicated by it. Uh, that's not what this is about. What we've tried to do is use that technology in what we do and that's uh, design, build, operate and maintain uh, mining facilities, both underground as well as above ground, the processing and the material handling and that sort of thing. So a little bit about the evolution of what got us here. Um, we, you know, like many other firms, have, have been using uh, 3D models to do a better job of conceptualizing facilities, whether those are underground or above ground, and, and getting them laid out and a 3D model allows you to tweak things, change it, what if, well, what if this were here, what if I did that over there, what if I increased this. And a 3D model allows you to quickly do some adjustments and, and, and hone in on hopefully what's a better design than the old days when we used to, you know, draft things out on 2D drawings and that sort of thing. But what we discovered was that um, in the design phase, uh, as much as you'd like uh, a constructor, for example, to look at a 3D image of what it is, um, you, you're still not getting their full appreciation of what it is you've put together, what it is you've tried to design. Uh, but it, it's been useful. And then, uh, what if the operators and the maintainers of that facility actually got to uh, look at the model, they look at it, and they, and they think, well, that's great, I, I see what, how it's laid out, but it's different when they can immerse themselves into more of a spatial reality. So that started us on uh, this evolutionary process of migrating 3D models, if you will, into more of that virtual reality space. So we go from, even though it's a 3D model, it's a 2D image of that model. It goes into a spatial recognition. And what you're going to see and what, you're, what you experience when you put the headset on is that it's dimensionally accurate. So when, when you bend over to see if you can reach up underneath something, it's really the dimensions. It's really that high. When, when you try to reach back in with a wrench that is virtual, you can see if that wrench is going to be in there. Or if you're a constructor and you're wanting to rig something up to, to move a, a piece of equipment in and out, it will allow you to really see what's around you and the impediments to moving your piece of equipment around to get it installed. So that got us to thinking, let's, let's migrate from the 3D world, 3D model, into this virtual uh, model. So what I'm gonna talk about now is uh, a case study that we decided to test our uh, theory on to see uh, it's great for the designer, but what if we got the constructor and the operator and the maintainer to look at it in reality? What effect would that have? Would, would safety be enhanced? Would the operability be enhanced or the maintainability or the constructability of what uh, we're doing? And, and so we decided to test that theory because what this is about, in, in one word, is prevention, right? We wanna prevent 
having to redo, rework, redesign something in the construction phase because uh, during the design phase we, we didn't really appreciate it. Or we want to avoid uh, requiring the maintenance group to have to do lots of workarounds in order to get in and, and, and maintain something or be able to monitor it effectively, thereby missing opportunities to, to uh, keep it from shutting down, an unplanned shutdown, or uh, just to make sure that uh, the things they'll need to do to maintain it are, are provided for them. So the idea is we prevent those mishaps, those missteps, those redos, or just living with something by trying to hit it up front in the design phase and the virtual reality enables that because it's not just an image, it's a spatial awareness of what's there. So our theory is this case study that I'm gonna to talk to you about. It's a, uh, um, a situation where we looked at it and we said, yeah, from the engineering and design standpoint, we see value in it, but fabrication, construction, uh, operations and maintenance, uh, yes, it, it's, it's gotta be there. So how do we prove that? So we took this uh, situation, it's an actual case. One of our clients had an old uh, uh, high, uh, conveyor system that was fairly lengthy, but it was elevated about 80 feet above the ground. Um, and it was required to operate 24-7 uh, in 365 days a year. So it was operating in extreme hot and extreme cold and ice and snow and, and everything else. Uh, and, and what was happening to that structure over the years is because it was designed in a way that they couldn't get in and maintain it effectively, they couldn't monitor and see uh, what was going on with it, they experienced breakdowns. And then uh, they couldn't actually observe what the structure was like and there was a lot of corrosion taking place. But because they couldn't get to it and see it, it, it got to a, a, really an unsafe condition. Right. So at any rate, um, here, here we had this uh, real situation that, uh, you know, we, we had a theory, uh, but we needed to put it into practice. We needed to actually have a constructor or a construction team look at it. We actually needed to have the owner's operations and maintenance team look at it because it, it was, uh, you know, unsatisfactory with what they were doing. So. Here's kind of a, a quick rendering of it. It's fair, it is a fairly long conveyor. It's about 80 feet off the ground, as I had mentioned. And uh, they're out there having to work on this at night, to monitor at night. Uh, and that might even be in the middle of winter in a driving snowstorm, which quite often happens in this area. So we started off and modeled it up uh, from, our, from the engineering and design perspective. And, we all know that engineers and designers are absolutely perfect in everything they do. They do not make mistakes, right? No? So take our best shot and, and we start bringing the folks in. And the first thing that happens when uh, one of the operators from the, from the actual plant where this was at put the headgear on and he's starting to walk along the platform that you see there, he's getting disoriented because so down below you see some of the modeled structures. We put the, them in there because it was something that that operator was used to actually seeing in his normal operation. So we gave him a perspective. There's a compressor building down there and some other structures. So it was a realistic orientation for him. So as he was walking along in the dark of night and looking down, he was getting very disoriented and, and it became, oops, it became uh, really a safety concern because the last thing you want to have somebody uh, experience is, is uh, you know, a little bit of imbalance and some, so forth in such a precarious position. So at any rate, what the virtual reality system uh, wound up uh, doing is we modeled in a different lighting configuration. So we changed the spacing on the lights. We changed the illumination on the lights. And uh, it wound up uh, causing the, the human part of him to be more comfortable with having to uh, be out there in these conditions. So safety became one of the major benefits of our little case study that, that we observed. Uh, and I'll go into that a, a little bit more, but the lighting was one of the major things that got straightened out with it. And I hope I do this right. Uh, this, so, so when you get in there and you look at the virtual reality you're, you're going to, did it work? Yes, I'm doing 
Yeah. It's like that. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, so what, what you see is, and this is what you'll experience when you put the headset on, you can see the uh, maintenance guy up on the left. Can you start that again, Tara? Just put it in the middle. Yeah, and just click it. There you go. He's looking around, and as he's turning his head and, and stooping down, he actually put his head right through the, the protection barrier so he can see the motors, the gearboxes, and all that sort of stuff in there. So he can see what he's going to have to access and be able to monitor and maintain in there. And then uh, the second one, the, the maintenance guy, he's walking along the conveyor system. So, yeah, so, so just go back up here and, and do, launch that one. So he's walking along and, and he has this little wrench in his hand you'll see in a minute. He squats down and he looks up underneath there. He sticks his arm back in to see how far he can reach. To, to maintain the uh, conveyor components and so forth. So, and this is just a short video, but th this is kind of what you're going to experience when you put the headset on. But this is two dimensional and it doesn't do it justice. Uh, you'll, you'll ride the roller coaster when you go in there and see it. So, at any rate, what winds up happening, continuing on in this little evaluation, this experiment, where we're trying to see really what the value is of this whole system. What we get as feedback is um, we, we had originally had the design laid out where this was a fully enclosed conveyor system. And uh, the operators and the maintainers, as they began to walk through it and look at it in the virtual space, they, they determined that actually a fully hooded uh, conveyor system was actually impeding their ability to observe and then also to access and maintain things. So what we then did is we removed the full hooding and put in a three-quarter hood and then let them go back through and see if they could do what they needed to do, squat, look around, get up in, monitor things, measure it, and so forth. And, and, and they did. And they said, we want the three-quarter hood. We don't want the more expensive fully hooded uh, conveyor system. So we were able to save a little bit of money uh, by reducing that. And then the other thing that uh, one of the safety aspects uh, uh, that kind of goes along with the, the uh, person walking along uh, the walkways at night was they felt that the, even though the, the safety requirement was only to have three rungs on those handrails, they felt better about having four, right? Even though it wasn't required from a safety standpoint, they, they said, let's, let's do the four. So we put the four in there. Now, that was maybe a little extra cost, but what wound up happening is when they take the grating off, and you can kind of see the grating right here, there, there are many places where there's moving equipment and you don't want a tool belt to accidentally catch as somebody's walking by or, or clothing or a cord or something like that. They have to actually physically remove those. So what wound up happening is we set it up so that they can move those over to the four rung uh, bars and fasten them to the four rung bars and they wouldn't uh, slip down and off of the platform with the four rungs. So on the one hand, yes, it added a little bit of cost because of the fourth rail, but on the other hand, it enhanced safety. So there was a decent trade-off there. Then the other thing that we found out is that when we originally designed this, there were actually two walkways, one on either side. That's typically what you do on some of these conveyor systems because of the need to access it. But when uh, the uh, operators and the maintainers got up there and started reaching through, they said, uh, we, we can do everything we need to do from one side. The other side is just redundant and it's not adding any value. Let's eliminate the walkway on the other side. So the cost was significantly reduced because of that. So um, what began to emerge is that there are a lot of uh, opportunities, let's call it, to enhance safety and to actually cut back on the costs and so forth by streamlining the design. So again, let me go back to my original one word message. It's all about prevention. We were able to do all of this before we started construction. Where they're at right now in the process is they are demolishing the old structure and we're getting ready to put the new one in there, 
Uh, and the other thing that, that uh, happened after the study is we gave the model or, or had the, the modelers, uh, I'd be sorry, had the fabricators look at this uh, so that they could see the best place to break the structure apart and put in pick points and stuff for rigging to get it to fly it up into place 80, 80 feet above the ground. So it's been used a lot in, in the construction execution planning as well. So that had a benefit to it, but we didn't have the opportunity to really measure that at the time we were doing the case study. Is it uh, possible, when, when you set up a, an initial model and it's set up as a final model, are there any opportunities uh, to do updates real time of those models as conditions change in the in, the, in your uh, natural environment? You mean after it's been constructed? So, so, so you have a model that has been rendered, mm -hmm. and and uh, are, is it possible in, in your current uh, setup to do uh, real time updates? Yeah, it, it's, it's not real time. Now, um, keep in mind, we've been doing this for a year. And the technology that we're using uh, to do this, um, we, we have uh, an agreement with uh, a, an individual from the gaming community where all of this VR stuff was pioneered, right? And we're quickly moving towards the real advanced capability that the gaming community already has pioneered, right? But what we've spent uh, the last year doing, and probably just in the last three months, we've cut the transition time for taking a 3D model into the virtual reality space from about uh, 65 hours on average. It's now down to like two days, right? And we believe, and what we're, what we're writing are algorithms to help automate the transition from the 3D model into the VR space, and we're hoping to get even faster and faster at it. But it's new to us. It, it, this hasn't been done anywhere in the industry yet, so we're a little bit on the bleeding edge, I guess you might say. But our goal is for the modeling approach to, yes, get it down to almost real time if we can. Now, let me just introduce another thing that I'm going to talk about here in, in, in a minute in a little more depth is the other thing that we're doing a, a proof of concept on along those same lines, there are very sophisticated cameras, again, that have primarily come out of the gaming industry that uh, are able to do like a LiDAR scan that I think most people are familiar with. A LiDAR actually does a geometrically correct scan of, for example, if you wanted to scan this room, you would actually get every, you know, clear dimension for height, width, and depth, uh, and so forth. But what the cameras also do is they marry the texture of what it is it's measuring in with the geometry. So it knows glass, it knows drywall, it knows window shades, so forth and so on. But it does it instantaneously, right? So to get to what you were talking about, there, there's a way, for example, we, we've been asked a lot to look at as-built situations, right? There, uh, in fact, one, one client we have uh, is, is a smelter. He runs a smelter. And when it was originally uh, designed uh, 20 or 30 years ago, I don't, I'm not sure how far back it was, the ductwork that removes the very caustic and, and heated materials in the area was inadequately designed, but they've just had to live with it, right? And they, uh, unfortunately, it was done so long ago, they don't have any as-belts for it. So what they've asked us to do is put a camera in there and scan it put it directly into the VR environment and then toy around with a different ductwork configuration. Expanding them out, looking to see where we might be able to fasten them, hang them uh, where they're at now or completely reroute them. So we're embarking upon that realm right now. Heretofore we haven't had to do that, but the more this is getting out there and understood and the understanding of the power of it, these creative ideas keep coming back. These individual situations that people are confronted with, these challenges, we keep getting asked, could you do this, could you do that? And it's been driving us that way. And so what, what you know, we've, we're working on now, again, this is kind of a proof of concept stage, but uh, anyone that's been underground in a mine or anywhere in a mining operation, uh, you know, outdoors as well, um, knows that uh, miners can be in a very precarious situation. 
So in our business, one of the one of the main areas that we're very concerned about is, for example, underground and hard rock mining. If if they've uh, blasted a stope and they're starting to clear that stope out, you're always susceptible to these slides of the rum rubble, right, coming back on the operator that's trying to scoop it up and move it out. So that operator of that scoop is in harm's way. So what we've done is uh, mount, we have a little piece of equipment for the proof of concept. We mounted one of these sophisticated cameras on it and put the VR system uh, back remotely so that the operator can actually look around and see the dangers and see what's going on inside that area, right? So he can, he can decide, well, I need to remove more material from the left side because it looks like it's about ready to roll on me versus over on the right side. And so he's, he's able to do that out of harm's way. Or scaling, when, when you go in and you've blasted an area, you, you need to knock the stuff off of the walls and the ceiling that has a potential to, to fall on you because it's loose, right? So we want to, you know, mount it onto scaling equipment so that the operator can scale without fear of a, of a boulder falling on his head, right? So that's one of the, the areas that's a little bit like the real-time situation. It, it is a real-time way to utilize the virtual reality that enhances the safety. Um, the other thing that we've been approached about is uh, one of our clients has an operation over in Mongolia. That's remote, it's extremely difficult to get uh, a SWAT team out there if something happens, a troubleshooting team. So what they want to do is, is uh, set up a prototype of this camera out there that's real time that can actually look at, uh, for example, pressure gauges on equipment or temperature gauges or other diagnostic equipment real time with a virtual reality camera there, but they have experts all over the world. They have some in Australia, some in the United States, and some in Canada. And what they want to be able to do is link them all together in this virtual environment, right, so that uh, they together as a team can help solve the problem that's going on over in Mongolia and help instruct them on what to do. So uh, it, it hopefully will have that practical application. So we're, we're starting that proof of concept. But the other thing that you see down there at the bottom of the screen, when, when somebody is trying to diagnose a problem, it's very handy to have the specifications of the equipment or what the maintenance history of that equipment was, right? When it broke down, what, when did it break down last? Why did it break down? So if this team, that's out there looking at the problem in Mongolia has immediate access with the virtual headgear on to, to click on something and say, what's the maintenance history on that? Why did it break down last time? They can bring that up and, the, and because it'll be connected to the database real time, they'll have that uh, repository of information right at their fingertips. And so they can uh, diagnose a lot better and come up with better suggestions on, on how to get it taken care of. So, um, those are just a few of the things, some, some others that e every time we go someplace a new idea comes in and, and we're, we're putting them on list, but it's hard for us to attack all of them at one time. Uh, a number of times we've been asked about mine rescue teams and getting them set up to view where they're going to have to go, potentially in an emergency, and, and help uh, and, and get them used to that in virtual reality. But then the question came up, can you simulate something as they're going in there to uh, startle them, to play with their emotions, have a flash fire go off right when they're down there. Because you think differently when you know, you're just wandering in knowing what your mission is than when something un unexpected happens. So they were, looking, they were asking us, can we simulate fires or floods or you know, whatever the, the case might be to help better prepare those rescue teams that are going to be going into a situation. So there are a number of different things that, again, uh, we, we've got just tons of great ideas from folks like yourselves to, to work on. Uh, we're trying to use our re resources as best we can. but.